What's up, podcast listeners? Cam Martinez here with another incredible interview to start out our first season of the Six Figure Roadmap. Today, we're joined by none other than Mr. Ryan Levesque. You may know him. He is the Inc. 500 CEO of the Ask Method Company and the number one national best-selling author of Ask, which was named by Inc. as the number one marketing book of the year. His work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Forbes, and Entrepreneur, and over 250,000 entrepreneurs subscribe to his email newsletter offering business advice. He is also a co-founder and investor in Bucket.io, a leading marketing funnel software for entrepreneurs, and his latest book, Choose, helps readers avoid making the single biggest mistake when starting a business and guides people through answering all the, the all important question, what type of business should you start? So if you stick around to the end, Ryan is going to give you actually a free copy of his book, Choose. So without further ado, Ryan, welcome to the show. Cam, it is uh, awesome to be here. I'm super excited to dive right in and to be chatting with you and really grateful for the opportunity to be sharing and, and chatting here today. Absolutely. What would make this the most fulfilling show you've ever done? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, I am, uh, uh, you know, I put my blood, sweat, and tears into this book, um, sharing what I've learned and the mistakes I've made in the last decade of being in business for myself. And uh, if this book can change the life of just one person listening to this right now, then, um, you know, I'm going to walk away a happy man after our time together. I think we can make that happen, man. It's super, super excited to have you on here. And to start out, I, I just want to hear your story of, of how you got started. We were chatting before and you said that you would be able to provide some awesome insight to our listeners. And you always talk about how your first goal was to make your first 10 K a month. So will you please give us a little bit, bit of insight on that and how you started? Yeah, man. You know, when I first got started, I was, uh, I was working in a, um, you know, my last job, um, which is over 10 years ago. It's crazy to think this, but my last like real job for a real company, um, I was working in insurance in a cubicle and I wanted to be my own boss. Like I think so many of us, like I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to have control of my own hours. I wanted to have freedom. I wanted to be able to travel. I wanted to do all these things. And my big goal at that time was to make $10,000 a month uh, in income in my business. And just this past year, last year, across all of our businesses, we uh, just passed over $10 million in revenue and uh, landed on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing companies in America. And, and I, I share that for two reasons. Number one, uh, to show you, you know, what's possible no matter what your expectations are for yourself right now, whatever dreams you've set for yourself, whatever goals you've set for yourself. Uh, but number two, to show you that um, I've learned a lot in the last 10 years, I've made a lot of mistakes. And what I'm hoping to do today in this interview is pass along some of the wisdom that I've learned along the way and some of what I share uh, inside this book, Choose. I'm excited. I'm excited to hear all the insight you're, you're getting ready to drop on us. The, the first thing I want to talk about, though, is I was actually listening to uh, the beginning part of your interview with, with JLD, who I hope to have on the show in the future. And you were describing an issue that the people who were failing with your uh, initial ask methodology we're having. And you said, it, it's kind of like putting a raft in the river. It could be the best raft in the world. You could have the best crew working the raft. The weather could be perfect. The water could be perfect. But if you put that raft in the wrong direction or you put the raft in a river with no water, you will never reach your destination. I thought that was incredible. And will you please elaborate on what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, you you nailed it. You hit the nail on the head. I think it's a metaphor that's so um, uh, so important and so spot on. See, in my first book, Ask, um, you know, it sold hundreds of thousands of copies and it's impacted a lot of people. You may have seen the Ask method being used. Big companies are using it. Small companies are using it. Um, and really, it's a methodology to understand and figure out what people want to buy in any market. Um, and, it's, and it's a series of questions that you need to ask in a very specific way, using specific language, analyze those answers in also a very specific way that uncovers these insights. And when you write a book like Ask and it's reached as many people as it has, you get emails, you get letters, you get um, you know, notes from people who say, the book changed my life. But <laughs> you also get letters from people who read the book who say, dude, 
I read the book, I followed it exactly as you teach, and it didn't work for me. And when you get letters like that, when you get messages like that, it's sort of like a sucker punch in the gut because it makes you think, well, what did I do wrong? What was I missing? Where did I, you know, did I mislead people? What mistakes did I make along the way? And it sort of sparked what became a three-year research project to really understand and dig in what was going on there. And what I found was that all roads kept coming back to the same problem, the same mistake. And that's this, people were choosing bad markets. And I realized that in Ask, I taught people the methodology that I had used to go into 23 different niche markets successfully over the past decade plus. But what I didn't teach was how and why I chose those markets specifically. Like of the millions of markets online, the millions of possible niches, why those 23? What was the thought process? What was the methodology around that? And so I really embarked on this journey, Cam, to uh, document a process for deciding what niche to go into and how to choose not what you're going to sell, not what you're going to create, but choose who you're going to serve, which is the single most important decision you need to make before starting your business. It's the decision in your metaphor um, of choosing the right river. You can have the best boat, as you said, the best crew. You can bust your butt. You can row 18 hours a day. But if you choose a river that's not going to take you to where you want to go, you're never going to get to your destination. You're never going to hit that goal that you set up for yourself uh, in launching and growing your business. Oh, it's incredible. I, that metaphor just speaks so true to me, and I know to it will to so many other people too. I just thought it was incredible and definitely something that needed to be shared. Um, what are three key items you think people should be focusing on when trying to bridge the gap from where they are to where they want to be financially in their business? Yeah, you know, well, it's, it's all going to come down to uh, that first decision, right? Which is who you're going to serve, what market you're going to go into. And, and what I'll talk about is I'll talk about a few of uh, the factors that we identified in this research that separate what makes a successful market from an unsuccessful market. Now, it's easy for us to say, like, pick a good market. Like, that's easy to say. But what does a good market mean? Like, what does that actually mean? How do you quantify that? right? Like what size market? How much competition? Like what are the factors you want to be looking for? And I was curious uh, as well. And so um, what we did, if you've read any of the work of Jim Collins, Good to Great, Great by Choice, Built to Last, any of those books, I'm a huge fan of his work. Uh, his work is, uh, is predicated on studying publicly traded companies and looking at what separated companies that have been successful for decades from those that were maybe successful for a period of time, but uh, either disappeared or kind of fell by the wayside. And similarly, I was very interested to study what was it that separated our most successful markets of those 23 businesses, which, uh, what were the factors that separated the ones that were most successful from the ones that were less successful? Um, I did the same thing with our uh, private clients, with our students. Um, and what we ended up coming up with is that there are seven factors. Um, and there are seven factors, and I talk about what these seven factors are in the book, and I talk about the tests that you can perform to figure out if your market is what we call a green light market or if it's a red light market. Does it check off these boxes or is there a critical ingredient missing in your market? So you asked for three, we'll talk about a few of them. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is one of what we call the five market must-haves. So five factors that we identified every uh, market, every green light market has. Every one of our most successful home run businesses uh, checked off these boxes and every one of our less successful businesses and students and clients less su successful businesses were missing one of these ingredients. So first market must have is what we call uh, an evergreen market. Now, what do I mean by that? An evergreen market is in contrast to a fad market. An evergreen market is a market that was, you know, relevant 10 years ago, 50 years ago, and it's going to be relevant 10 years from now, 50 years from now. Now I learned this the hard way. <laughs> Um, when I, I mentioned, you know, the last job that I had was I was working in insurance and, uh, it was around that time that I was talking to my wife about wanting to start a business. And, uh, maybe you can relate, maybe some of your listeners can re relate to this, but at that time in my life, that's the only thing I could talk about. And every night at dinner, I'm talking to my wife and I'm saying, all right, honey, like how about this business and that business? And like, that's all we're talking about. And I think finally, after like 50 of these conversations, she got sick and tired of hearing me talk about these ideas. And she said, what about this idea? And uh, she showed me her computer one day 
And she said, uh, this is like in 2007, 2008. She said, hey, there's this new website that's just come out. It's called Etsy.com. Um, now, of course, we know Etsy today, but at the time, it was like a brand new website. And anyone not familiar, Etsy is like eBay for selling handmade products like uh, uh, jewelry and crafts and crocheted el elements and things like that. Um, she says, there's this new, uh, this new website. It's called Etsy.com. Um, and there's this jewelry that's selling like crazy. And it involves combining Scrabble tiles with origami paper and combining them to make them into these little pendants. And now at the time, Cam, my wife and I, we were living in China. So we were living in China. I was working in insurance in Asia. Uh, she was in grad school. She was getting her PhD in Hong Kong. And um, we're living in Asia. And, uh, and she says, um, we're in China. We have all the origami paper in the world. We have access to inexpensive labor. Uh, we can set up this little factory in Southern China and start selling the jewelry. And I said, whoa, 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 like time out. Like that is not the dream business that I thought I was going to be starting. Like I don't want to be tied to this factory in, in like polluted Southern China, making jewelry and importing it into the United States. That's like not my thing. So we closed the book on the idea. A few weeks later, we're having one of these conversations again. Um, and she says, uh, I want to talk about that Scrabble tile thing. And I was like, I thought we closed the book on this. She says, no, 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 time out. And once again, she showed me her computer. So check out this woman's shop on Etsy. Now, this woman that she showed me wasn't making the jewelry itself. Instead, what she was doing is she was teaching people how to make the jewelry. She was selling this little tutorial on Etsy. And you know, my wife showed me, she said, take a look. This woman is selling this tutorial. She's selling it for like 30 bucks. And look, she's selling like 30 of these things a day. Now, the cool thing about Etsy is that you could see a person's sales history. So you can see exactly how much they sold today, yesterday, the day before that. You go back you know, in time and look at how much they're selling. So you can basically reverse engineer their income. And this woman was selling like 30 copies a day at like 30 bucks. It added up to like 10,000 bucks a month. And so uh, my wife bought the tutorial and she said, this tutorial is not very good. She said, I think I can learn how to make the jewelry, do a better tutorial and we can start selling it. So that's what we did. We started selling the tutorial. In the first month we sold a couple of copies, then a few hundred dollars, then a few thousand dollars. Then we're making $8,000 a month. And I remember that month I was like, honey, we're gonna get rich on this idea. Like, this is crazy. Um, and then Cam literally the next month, our sales went down to almost zero. Now at this point, uh, I was so excited by all this. Like I quit my job. Um, my wife's in grad school, not making any money. We're burning through a lot of our savings. We're living in Hong Kong, China, one of the most expensive cities in the world. So we're burning through a lot of our savings. And we kind of have this moment where we say, oh crap, what do we do now? So my wife and I, we talked and she decided I'm gonna finish my program. She decided to get a job in the US and in Texas, in Brownsville, Texas, as a museum curator, which is what she studied in school uh, to become. And uh, the job paid $36,000 a year. We moved back to the States. We didn't have enough money to, to move our stuff back. So we had to sell everything that we owned, except for a suitcase of stuff each. We moved into a 500 square foot apartment, bars on the windows, less than a mile away from the Mexican border uh, in Brownsville. Um, we have a mattress on the floor, two lawn chairs, a, a tiny car that I would drive my wife to and from work every single day and I got to work. And I learned the importance of uh, the first market must have, being in an evergreen market when I launched my next business. This time uh, I learned my lesson and I said, I'm gonna look for a hobby that's gonna be around forever. So not a hobby that was around for like, you know, five minutes, like one that's gonna be around forever. So I started looking at what are the oldest hobbies in America? And uh, the oldest hobby in America, the longest hobby that's been around forever in America, it's been number one or number two, uh, a top hobby among Americans for the last hundred years is gardening. So I started looking at niches within the gardening market and stumbled on orchid care when I was kind of going through the list of ideas in my head and, and putting them all down. When we lived in China, we had a bunch of orchids and they basically all died. Like we bought a bunch of orchids, put them in our apartment and then like within a week or two, they all died. So I thought there's gotta be other people who've had the same problem. So we went into orchid care. Now in that business that we started, we went from zero to $25,000 a month uh, in 18 months and then took that business to over half a million dollars a year. My wife quit her job, went all in with me in the business, moved from Brownsville, Texas to Austin, Texas, which is where we've been for about the last 10 years, and um, uh, we're on our way. Now, why do I share that story? Well, the punchline to the story is this. That little orchid business, which still exists today, over 10 years later, still pays for our living expenses. Now, wow. you compare that to the Scrabble tile business that was around for like five minutes and disappeared, that orchid business has been around for the past decade 
and will be around for years and years and years to come. So that underscores that first factor that you asked about. You want to be in an evergreen market. Now, being in an evergreen market is great, but it's actually not enough. There's a second factor that I'll share. You also need to be in what's called an enthusiast market. I learned this the hard way. Now, an enthusiast market is in contrast to a problem solution market. A problem solution market is a market where you solve a problem for someone in their life, and then they kind of never really want to think about that thing ever again. An example would be like wart removal. If you help people remove a wart, like a wart is a thing that no one wants to talk about. You're not posting about it on social media. You're not signing up for any like wart, like email newsletters or Facebook groups or like clubs. Like that's it. It's like you solve this problem and you want to move on. That's it. Now compare that to a market like the, the dog market. Uh, the dog market is a market that's an enthusiast market. Now, an enthusiast market is defined by uh, being a market where you can sell to the same individual over and over again over a period of months, years, and maybe even decades. Now, if you uh, have a dog, you know what it's like. You get a dog and you, know, you get to buy doggy food, you get to buy doggy uh, uh, leashes, you get to buy doggy toys, you get to buy doggy beds and doggy Christmas ornaments and doggy t-shirts and all the doggy stuff. I know this because my wife uh, got a dog last year, a little four and a half pound chihuahua, um, and uh, that we rescue a rescue on the side of the side of the road that they found on the side of the highway. Um, and um, you know, we spend more money on that dog on a pound for pound basis than anything I've ever had in my entire life. Um, but it underscores the type of market you're looking for. You're looking for a market where people spend over and over and over again, and they're consumers in that market for years. Uh, other examples are the weight loss market. If you know anybody who struggled with their weight in their life, or like me, you've kind of, you've been the one that's wanted to do something about your weight. People aren't in the weight loss market for five minutes and then they're done. Oftentimes people are in that market for their entire lives. Um, and so the book, I, I talk about uh, some of these factors. Um, enthusiast market. That's the evergreen market is the first one. Enthusiast market is the second one. Uh, we may have time for one more. Uh, the, the third factor I'll talk about, because you asked for three, is it's not enough to be in an evergreen and enthusiast market, you also need to solve what's called an urgent problem in that enthusiast evergreen market. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you go in the dog market, it's not enough to go in there and solve, you know, and start selling doggy mugs or doggy carpets or doggy Christmas ornaments. Um, instead, you've got to find what is the urgent problem, the bleeding neck problem, the, what I call $10,000 problem that keeps people up at night in that market. Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of uh, an urgent problem, an example of an urgent problem in the dog market um, would be if you bring a new puppy into your home, like we did, I learned this the hard way. Um, we had a puppy who was in our home and was peeing on everything. Peeing on the rug, peeing on the carpet, peeing on the floor, peeing on the bed, peeing on the laundry. Well, that's an example of an urgent problem that caused me to go to my wife and say, honey, we got to solve this thing tonight. Like we can't let this go on any longer. And when you have a problem like that, people lose all price sensitivity. They're not shopping around trying to save 15% with a discount code for weeks and weeks. They go online, they look for a problem and they want to solve it now. And that's the type of problem you're looking to solve in your enthusiast evergreen market. So those are just a few examples, Cam, of factors that you want to be looking for to set your, your, yourself up for success in your market. And I'll, 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 I'll throw it out your way, and I'll ask anyone who's listening to this right now, um, of at least those three factors, we haven't covered all of them, um, how does your market and your business stack up? Do you feel like you've checked off those three boxes? Like, how do you feel like things have stacked up for you? I love it. I, I mean, that's absolutely even just those top three things you haven't even listed the, the next two and I already want to dive deep into your book and read more about what the five market must-haves are and I, I have a question because you've done so much research on this subject mm. what do you see being the number one most important aspect of business growth and success in the next two years yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, I could take this in so many different directions. Um, one that I'll, I'll talk about is, is around market size, right? Um, and, and here's the reason why. One of the most common, if not the most common question I get asked is uh, when it comes to evaluating your niche, your market, your business, is, um, uh, is my market, um, uh, have, I, have, I, have I gone into the right size market? Is my market too small? Is it too big? 
And I think it comes from, you know, there's an expression that many of us are familiar with, which is there are riches and niches. Like we've heard that before. Um, and it leads us to wonder, should I niche down and be more specific? Am I too specific? Should I go bigger and broader? It's kind of like, well, how do you figure that out? And I've gotten this question for so long that I was curious and I wanted to come up with a better answer uh, because the truth is I didn't have a good answer. And so one of the things that we looked at when we did this research is we looked at every single one of our 23 markets. We looked at our students, our clients' markets, and I wanted to see if there's any correlation between market size, and you talk about growth over you know, a two-year period, market size and uh, success. And what we found, interestingly, Cam, is that there is a, a connection. There is a correlation between market size and our most successful businesses that we looked at. And what was interesting is that our most successful businesses weren't too big, weren't too small. They all fit within this very narrow range. Every single one of our home runs all fit in this very specific and narrow range. And the way we measured a market size was by keyword volume. So we looked at the amount of people searching for that topic online. And uh, for months, my team and I debated like, are we going to actually reveal these keywords or not? Like, you know, it's one, it's one thing to, you know, talk about your business. It's another thing to like reveal your most successful keywords. Because I knew if I shared our most successful businesses, most successful keywords, we'd be inviting a lot of competition. Like people would see them and say, well, I'm going to go into that business. Um, and so we debated for months. But in the end, we made the decision that in the book to reveal what these keywords are and how to compare your keyword what we call your bullseye keyword. It's a process I teach you how to figure out in the book what your bullseye keyword is compared to these reference keywords to see is your market in the market size sweet spot? In other words, is it too big? Is it too small? Or is it right in that same narrow range that you want to be looking for? And if there's one factor that will set you, set you up for growth over the next two years, uh, it's to make sure that you are in a business that's in that sweet spot. You don't want to throw your raft uh, in a river that's too small because you're never going to get anywhere. But at the same time, if you throw your raft in the middle of the ocean, you're going to be swallowed up whole. So you've got to be in a river that's the right size, just the right amount of current, just the right size that's going to get you to that destination. Incredible. So much valuable insight already. And we've talked a lot about the tactical ways to, to generate consistent income, how to infiltrate a market that's going to serve you long term in your business. But we haven't talked about who this information is really for. Who did you sure. write this book for? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll actually uh, I'll pull a, a brief passage from the beginning of the book to answer this question. Um, the beginning of the book, I wrote a dedication, and it, and it reads like this. If you've ever had the crazy dream to start your own business, if you've ever dreamed of doing your own thing, if you've ever failed or lost it all on something in a quest to shake the status quo, if you have something right now that is changing the world, but you don't know where to take it next, or if you're simply trying to figure out what you want to do and who you want to be when you grow up, this is the book I wish someone had written when I was where you are right now. In short, this book right here is for you. So if you, uh, having heard that, resonate with any of what I just mentioned, this is the exact book I wish someone else had written when I was where you are right now uh, to guide me through that all important process of how to choose the right market, how to decide on what niche to go into, and how to make sure that you're starting the right business. Whether this is your first thing that you've ever done and you're you know, working a full-time job right now and maybe starting a side hustle or your first business, or you have an existing business right now that maybe feels like you're paddling upstream and you're, gonna ha you're having to work so much harder than it feels like you need to or should be uh, to get to where you wanna go. And maybe you just need a slight tweak or pivot in a slightly different direction to find that thing that's going to take off. Man, you're hitting so many pain points in so many people's minds right now. <laughs> it's, it seems like this book has like all the information that we would probably end up talking about on the show and already have talked about. Oh, that's it. We're canceling. Go get the book. That's all you need in your business. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I love all the information you've shared. Um, highly, highly recommend grabbing both books, ask the ask method and choose and stick around a little bit longer. We'll, we'll give you that link to go grab it for free. <laughs> there it is. I have some rapid fire questions for you just to, to get to know you a little bit better outside of your ever so 
intricate research that you put into this book? Sure. I'm ready. All right. First one is what is one non-negotiable habit you implement every single day? I uh, meditate every single day using my muse headband. Love it. What is one book you wish everyone in the world would read? Well, aside from choose, which of course I'm biased, um, you know, there's a great book that I read recently. It's a dense book. It's uh, called uh, Principles by Ray Dalio. Um, it's a very dense book. If you haven't read it before, it's, um, it's a very philosophical book from one of the greatest hedge fund managers of our time. Such a great book. What do you like to spend your time and money on outside of business? That's an easy one for me. I'm what we call a total A-fole. Not an A-hole, an A-fole, which stands for adult fan of Lego. I'm a huge Lego fan. I've got two boys. Uh, we buy like a new set practically every single week. We've got an entire room in our house, which is our Lego room. Um, we're, uh, we're pretty obsessed with Lego. So that's an easy one for me. That's where I spend all my, that's where I spend all my millions is on <laughs> Lego. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> where is one place you would move if you were forced to re relocate? Forced to relocate. We've thought about this on more than one occasion. Um, moving to Puerto Rico, we've actually considered it. Great weather, great people, and as an American, there are incredible tax benefits um, afforded to you when you move to Puerto Rico that effectively take your income tax down to four uh, percent income tax. So, um, if you're in a high tax environment, it's uh, it's an incredible opportunity. We've considered it uh, very seriously on uh, multiple occasions over the last few years. Well, you're welcome, Puerto Rico. You're about to get a lot of transplants coming your way. <laughs> All right, last one. You're stranded on an island. Who are two celebrities you would want to be stranded with? Oh, man. That's, like, really hard. Um, I would have to say uh, Jeff Probst. Is that his name? The host of Survivor? He probably would know how to, like, you know, get us out of there. <laughs> Um, and I'd say Tom Hanks, you know, because he got, his, got himself out of there. Just like all we need is Tom Hanks, Jeff Probst, and Wilson. And we're getting off that island and back to civilization. <laughs> that is an amazing answer. I was not expecting that. I love that so much. We have a lot in common, actually. Um, thank you so much for all the insight that you provided. I mean, there's so much more inside of your book. I'm, I can guarantee that. And with all of the other things that you have out in the world that are impacting people's lives every day. I, I'm just going to go ahead and guess that your superpower is connection because it seems like you connect with people on, on a level that's higher than most entrepreneurs higher than most people with all the things that you're giving away all the information that you provided would, that, would you say that's pretty accurate you know i think it all starts with uh, empathy and understanding okay. whatever market you decide to serve whoever is your uh, who that you choose to focus on it all starts with empathy and understanding uh, understanding what your market is going through at a deep emotional level, um, understanding who you're serving and uh, having empathy towards um, that individual and just serving at the absolute highest level that you possibly can. And when you do that, um, you know, and focus on changing the world, then good things happen. Man, with all the amaz amazing things you've done and continue to do, thank you so much for being a guest on our show today. I awesome. have two final questions. Okay. First one is how can people get a copy of your book? Well, you know, I wanted to do uh, something super special for, for you, for your audience. I'm really grateful first and foremost uh, for the opportunity to share this. So um, uh, you can obviously, you can buy the book anywhere. You can buy it at Barnes and Noble, at Amazon. It's $24.99 in the US, $33.99 in Canada. Um, but I wanted to, as you alluded to at the beginning of the interview, um, give everyone an opportunity to get a free hardcover copy of the book that I'll ship to you anywhere in the world. All I ask is that you pay a few dollars shipping and handling just to cover the postage. And when you do that, uh, to bribe you, because I want to make this like a super no-brainer, I'm going to hook you up with $200 in bonuses. Number one, I'm hooking you up with the audiobook for free. So you don't have to buy the audiobook separately. I'm just going to gift that to you for free. So if you're the type of person that likes to listen to books like I do in the car, the gym, wherever, like I'm going to hook you up with that. Number two, the, one of the single biggest questions I get asked is, what are examples of niche markets that check off all of those boxes, that pass the seven tests that I share in the book that are green lights? Well, what I'm going to give everyone uh, listening to this right now, uh, when you use that link that we're about to give you, um, is uh, the 25 niche markets that I would be going into in 2019. 
These are uh, a list of markets for my private list. Um, these are the exact markets I would be going into. Uh, there would be markets 24, 25, 26 of all my markets if I wasn't so busy talking about this book. So I'm going to hook you with that. And then over a whole bunch of other cool bonuses as well. Um, the special link that we set up, and this is important, it's the only way to get this, is to go to choosethebook.com uh, forward slash six figure, and that's six spelled out. So S-I-X figure, uh, choosethebook.com forward slash six figure. Go to that link, grab your copy of the book, and we'll hook you up with all the bonuses. And I truly do only have a limited uh, stock of these. These are kind of like for my, my personal stock. Um, once they're gone, they're gone. So if you want to do this, I highly recommend doing it now. And uh, it would be an honor to help uh, get this book in your hands. Oh, amazing. So generous. Thank you so much for giving that to our audience. We're going to put all of those resources in the show notes. You can find them at lvrg.it and on your favorite podcast platforms. Just search for Ryan Levesque. He's the inspiring entrepreneur who's creating amazing resources for you to reach your true potential and always putting out amazing content and education for you. Um, so again, that's choosethebook.com forward slash six figure. Ryan, I have one last question for you. What is one final piece of advice that you would give to our audience? You know, I'll share something I share with all of my students and it's this, you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it going, but the best time to get it going is right here, right now, today. So go out there and change the world. You heard it here from Ryan Levesque. Thank you so much for being a guest on our show again. My name is Cam Martinez, and I hope that you gained some knowledge and insight today that will help you craft your roadmap to six figures and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you, man.